What's happening, you savages? Uncle Joey here. Welcome to the check-in. It's Tuesday, the 23rd of January. I got to talk to you for a minute. Guys, remember the days when you could have sex in the morning, afternoon, late at night, and four times here? You were a savage. Remember those days? You didn't give a fuck. Things may have slowed down with age, but thank God for Blue Chew. You're saying, Joey, what are you torturing me for? Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra. I thought Levitra was a heart medicine, but who gives a fuck? All these ingredients, but it's a chewable tablet at a fraction of the cost. You can take the tablets any time of the day, so you can plan ahead or pop one whenever you bump into a victim by mistake. You know what I'm saying? Listen, these things are great. They come in individual pouches. You can put them in your wallet. Just don't sit on it. And, uh, you know, you meet somebody, you bump into your wife, your girlfriend, you're at a bar, you want to get the party started, you want to give her a stab in the bathroom, you want to ask for some water, you pop a pill, and within 15 minutes, you know, you're doing your thing. The best part about Blue Chew is it's all done online. No talking to no fucking doctor. You don't got to wait online at some fucking bum pharmacy. Well, everything that you're going to need is right there at your doorstep in a discreet package. The mailman won't know what it is. Your mom won't know what it is. Grandma won't know what it is. Even the victim won't know what it is. Blue Chew wants you to have better sex. Discover your options at bluechew.com. Chew it and do it, Jack. And listen, it's Tuesday. We got a special deal for the check-in listeners. Try Blue Chew free. I'm promising you all these fucking things. You're like, Joey, how am I going to give mama a stabbing for free? Because this is Uncle Joey, baby. I'm giving you Blue Chew for free. All you got to do is pay $5 for shipping. That's it. That's bluechew.com. Code Joey to receive your first month on the arm. Again, that's bluechew.com. Promo code Joey. And get your party started. Get your freak on. You can bet. You can put on some eyebrows and a cape, whatever turns you on. And now, without further ado, let's see what the hell Lee's doing. Turn off your TVs, run for your lives. It's over. They didn't put you on this planet just to give up. If Uncle Joey could do it, I could rule the world. That's what you got to be thinking. Welcome back to show. <laughs> What up, Turkey hey, Neck? Hey, buddy. Everything good to see you. Turkey you know, Neck, God damn it. Tip top fucking Magoo ready to rock here. What are you doing? You know what Athena's kids call me? What? I swear I swear to God, mashed potato tits. Okay, what are you going to do? You got to turn them <laughs> into hearts and potatoes now. You know what I'm saying? It's you Tuesday. Really it's Tuesday, the 20 fucking third, Lee. You got to get to those kettlebells again. That's it. That walking shit is good, but it doesn't, you know, it's to get the fat off, not to, you know, you got to start it, throwing it, some weights around. It's time. Yeah, it's Look, it's it's, the, it's time for that. Fucking, what's the hot black chick that shakes her ass? You know, the chick for right now, you could join for a dollar and a dollar for a month. Oh, Megan the Stallion or something? Yeah, might go over see Megan, Mother Nature, Mother, Mother, <laughs> whatever the fuck she calls herself. Go over there for a dollar, lift some weights, do some bench presses, do some push-ups and shit. What are you going to do? A lot more than that. I don't have mashed potato titties, but they're sagging a little bit like I had a kid. You know, it's like a, <laughs> fuck, like a, it's like a cat, but they're not pointy. At least they're not pointy. I've continued to keep some muscle under the tissue there by doing fucking slant. Uh, when I go to the gym once a week, I go to one gym and then the other one, when I go to the other one, I do bench presses, uh, you know, on a fucking whatever, on an angle, and then I do them minus, and then I do pullovers just to keep everything tight. But that ain't enough. I gotta go get some Mexican fucking uh, pills or some shit like that, so I can be two twenty tip top magoo. You know what I'm saying? You need that Swiss Chris Ali Sadiq was telling us about. Yeah, Swiss Chris. The Listen, thing that Swiss. made you shit. Yeah, that, that another fucking lunatic with another fucking suggestion. How is Nashville, Tennessee? Fucking really cool. Like, A, the city itself was just... Like, I'm not a music person. I know that sounds weird. I don't dislike it, but it's just not th something I care about. 
but it was just cool to see like like I like they look like they seem like me a little bit like they were just you know doing bar yeah, shows. Some of them were doing cover. Yeah, yeah, that too. That too. Trust me, there were guys in in cut off tank tops in seven degree weather. But um, it was just a really fun. It was just cool that like people came to see like came to my show. Like it was like I love opening for people, but it was just really like it meant a lot that people would come and and do that. And it wasn't. And it, like it was very cool for me, but it wasn't anything like glamorous or and it, we didn't sell a ton of tickets. It was like the the coldest it's ever been there, and they had got eight inches of snow, but it was just so awesome. It was for the experience. And then the question is that you gotta ask yourself when you're a comedian from one to five years, one of the things I forgot to do mm -hmm. that you overlook is the question of what did you learn tonight? But when you get upset about bombing or having a bad set. You don't think you learned anything, but you really fucking did. If you're honest with yourself, you're going to come out and tell me the microphone didn't work or the sound system, but the guy behind you got a standing ovation. Right. <clears throat> so you play all the, well, the guy before me pulled the rabbit out of his hat, out of his ass. So then you got to pull two rabbits out of your ass. You got to outdo the guy in front of you. You know what I'm saying? Well, absolutely. And I was thinking, I thought a lot about that this weekend because like the first night was Good. I I had a like a, I would say B minus set. People were happy. I did fine, but I noticed the second night, like the energy in the room was just better, and like I like I fed off of it, and I need to do a better job of like creating that energy if it's not already there, which is something like I think you were very good at. It's just like like making energy. Like I'm 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 getting okay. At, like if it's there, I can feed off of it, but it's hard to create it. To get energy in the beginning of a set, you got to go off your set. And you really got to pick up steam and have confidence with saying it because if you fall flat, now you're working for minus. Right. So those first two, you know, those first, that first minute, it's so weird how Kill Tony's a minute. I've been thinking about that. What can an open mic do in a minute? He could do a lot. He could do a fucking lot in a minute because and in, in a minute, you can make an introduction so special. That when you get off, they want more. It's so fucking weird how you have to, but I didn't look at it like that then. So that's how you have to look at it. You know what? I'm going to go up there and make them want more. How do I do that? So all those little contests and little things are planned out situations. It's like going to jujitsu and they say, today we're not going to roll. You're going to start with a guy on your back with a hook in. And all he has to do is close. What are you going to do from there? Work it from there. And it's called situational training, you know? And that's the same thing in comedy. You have situational training. So Friday nights, I hate Friday fucking nights. Really? Yeah. For comedy. Okay. And I'm going to tell you why. You got out of work at five. Mm -hmm. You drove to your mother's. You took a shower, you got dressed, you ate something with her, you gave her the solitaire cards, you ran to Athena. <laughs> now you have to drop Athena's two children off and then go do your show, right? Okay, yeah. Go watch this show at the Wilbur Theater. You get there at fucking 10 to 8, you walk in, you sit down, and you're huffing and you're puffing. You're huffing and you're puffing and you're trying to catch yourself. And all of a sudden, 10 minutes in, you realize, fuck, I'm fucking tired. Right, yeah. Okay? You know, it takes young guys. You know, when I was fucking 30, I could fucking leave work at 6 and be there at 7, and you're ready to go. But people overdo themselves sometimes. And they get there, and something's not right. The air's not working. You know, there's always a lot of stuff that you can't control. But you have to go up there, summarize it, control it, and then work with what you got. Oh, you only got yes. one fucking hand? All right, use the other hand. You know, it is a very, I, I can't break them all down because we didn't plan to have this chat, but right. it's just so weird. Saturday, I got the whole day to myself. I mow the lawn. When the kids are at fo football, I eat mama's monkey. I fucking have a few drinks. I, I go out to dinner with some friends. We're all in a great mood. Now we go see Lee Syatt. Bye-bye. Oh, wait, is he on? Yeah. 
I got yeah, nothing awesome. to do tomorrow. I could drink a little bit. I'm staying at the hotel right down the block so I could walk. It's a better feeling. They're more loose. How many of the people that come to it? How many of the 250 people that go to a Friday show have to work Saturday morning? Not many. Like I would sit there sometimes on Friday early show and go out to take pictures and I go, where the fuck are the people? They don't give a fuck about your picture. They got to go to work on Saturday. Oh, they got to go. So? Oh, okay. They got to go pick up the kid and go to work on fucking Saturday morning. They got to drop the kid off at the mother-in-law's at 730 because, you know, God knows what people have on this schedule. You as a comedian, you have to entertain them to take them off that schedule. They just right. pay you to take them away from their life for an hour. When they get the bill for the night, it brings them back. You know, at the, <laughs> when they drop the checks, 200, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I, but, I, I, it's crazy to hear you talk about that because it's, I don't really know. Like this, like the headlining thing is completely, di- like it's foreign to me. I have no idea what to expect. I felt like I was nervous. Like my flight got canceled on Thursday because of the snow, so I was, I was like freaking out about that. I was worried about if the show was gonna get canceled because I talked to the booker who was nice, but he was like, "Listen, man, they don't have plows down here, so like the entire every road is ice." Like the the parking lot to the venue was ice, and so like up until up until the day of the show, I didn't know if the show was going to happen. It was just well, crazy. What up? You were in the same boat as the people coming to see you on Friday night. Yeah, yeah, and it's just the fact that anyone like, especially in like a place like Nashville, I love doing. My favorite place right now to do shows are cities where there's not much to do, because like they're fun crowds and like a lot of people show up, but like the there's so much to do in Nashville. The fact that the 35 people came is like amazing to me. And like, it was a small venue. It was like a a 50 to a 75 seat room, but it was just so cool. And like the crowd was cool. The guy who uh, may or may not have given some like acid in the past showed up with his wife from North Hollywood. I'll ask you something. How crazy was that? We bought a a box of sugar cubes and we're putting acid on the sugar cubes in the office. Dude, at a point, there wasn't even sugar cubes. You just dropped it into my mouth. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you had all these sugar cubes. We didn't even use them. Oh, my God. Every time I go into the mouse, we'll eat one. <laughs> oh, one of the sugar cubes? <laughs> yeah. Remember, we ended up throwing them out. We we did the hit of acid like in four sugar cubes. Now I had 96 of them just sitting there like <laughs> bumps on a log and shit. What about all those? Because we all we used to get those stars, but they would give us like six or seven brownies that were tasted terrible, so oh. we never ate them. <laughs> and oh. like at the end, we moved out. We had like thirty bags of like moldy brownies that were two years old. Those brownies were so fucking bad, and those joints from the weed stores. We had about a hundred of those, the free joints. Oh it's yeah, like sandpaper. They give you all the weeds and the stems and the fucking dust on the counter. It's a fucking nightmare. Damn. When we left. When you said that to me the other night, I was like, liquid acid. What's he talking about? I'm like, oh shit. Oh yeah, dude. I didn't. That was just like the start of it. <laughs> now, look, dude, this guy brought like six different kinds of weed and some like mushrooms. And oh, yeah, I, a- I, I'm oh yeah. I'm Did you like, eat mushrooms, cocksucker. I had a little we split we split them and then I gave I didn't want to fly home with them. What, why not? What's going to happen? You put them in your fucking... What do you mean what's going to happen? Are you serious? Yeah. You put them in I'm your shaving. I'm paranoid. What well, paranoid? What, you don't think they know about shaving kits? You don't have a lock on your shaving kit. Oh, yes, you do. You put it on the no, dirty... No, you don't. Underwear. You put it on the dirty underwear. I oh, travel with four, five, eights on me. Different weed, just in case I get stuck on the island. Yeah, that's because TSA likes you. They know you. You. Yes, they don't they, know me. I separate they know from you. Them. No, they don't. Uh, no, they don't. You pack it up good, you cover it, you get some rolling papers, some lighters. You bring a lighter in your jacket. Even though they don't want lighters on the plane, you always bring a lighter. Just in case the plane crashes. How are they going to find you? You know what I'm saying? Just they in case. they you down? Huh? Yeah, they pat you down. But They you always pat you down. Your, yeah, you, well, I got metal in my knee, so now it stops me to hey, And then they <laughs> like, I have metal under there. Yeah, I got a fucking metal foot. All right. Stop bothering me. There's metal in my knee. I got to redo. You see the stitches? <laughs> All right, <laughs> I gotta redo. Yeah, I gotta redo. You wanna 
You want to see the stitches? So, yeah, now that's why you can bring stuff on. I, like, it's my listen, knee. And they I established early on that I was not going to go to a, a fucking town weedless. There's no way. It's too much to me. It's too much to my comedy. There's no way I'm going to a town. I, I used to travel into towns with no coke because I could always find a, a bum fucking coke dealer. But I can't count on the weed that I smoke in every state. So before we have a misunderstanding and I do buy an ounce and it's not what it is. And it wasn't grown in California. It was in my cousin grew it in Arizona, but it was supposed to be California. I don't want to hear that shit. I just bring the best weed with me. This week, when I went to Austin, I brought four different reefers with me. Gee, you're not smoking. nervous at all? Huh? You don't get nervous? No. no. They're for your health. They're, you're no, not they're not. See, you, you say know? this stuff like you could say it to the police and they would let you go. You're like, we established that I don't go weedless. No one established that. What do you mean? Like I believe LAX. <laughs> they don't, they're not worried about the fucking, you know, they're not worried uh, about the fucking eight the weed you bring. They're worried about the bomb in your gun and the electronic battery that might light under the fucking plane on fire. So don't ever, those dogs, I've been next to those dogs with a pound of weed, fucking boogaloo pill, the whole thing. And those dogs will fucking wag their tail and like they want to be my buddy. They're not there for fucking reefer and for fucking boogaloo pills. Yeah, but the one day they bring the one who is, I'm gonna be there. I, I get so fucking paranoid. Nah, you'll be fine. The dog barks, just tell them fucking you you're Jewish. Dog's been barking at you since the beginning of time. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> German oh, shepherds and Jews don't get along. That's why they invented the Semitic dog. To hold the oh. Jews against the wall and bark at them. <laughs> <laughs> and the Jews are in the corner. We'll give you my pastrami sandwich. Oh, no. Oh. I'm speaking of... The, what did you think of those, the, the tunnels? What tunnels? The one in the city? Yeah. They're disturbing. They're, it's very disturbing. You know, I've I heard different reports. Some people said they were storing kids down there. You know, to oh, fucking wow. molest them, like Epstein's Island. Some people said they were <laughs> putting hookers there, you know. They were the leftover kids from fucking uh, Epstein's Island, so they were going to put them down there and hold them up, but oh. they turned adults and let them out. I don't fucking know, Lee. Just the <laughs> fact that the Jews, the Hasidic Jews, I love them to death, but they're some creepy motherfuckers. They live <laughs> the They've taken over a town where I live here called Jackson. Right. Like on Saturdays, I just go through to see them walk the temple in a rush and shit like they got diarrhea. With those gumshoe, that detective gumshoe that they have, with that black fucking cape, but that they haven't washed in years, no head and shoulders, those fucking tassels, the dangling fucking dust on the jacket. They're hysterical, but they they're perverts. They're perverts. You ever, see, you ever see their wives? Oh, you have to be a pervert to marry those women. They like make them marry each other or something. Cause I don't know about those women. They wear those little shoes and shit like they're Dutch ladies. <gasps> <laughs> well, this is Jersey. I got those Hasids in Jersey. They're not fucking around, Jack. I, I was not. just, there was, there was just a video I saw today of like this prostitute in New York talking about that, about like a, a lot of her customers were Hasidic people. Not all of them, but like they just, they like to they do don't some even weird come the not. They come in a little cap. And they put it right back in the head like no. <laughs> that's why they go bald because they got sperm on the circle of their head there. Oh, that's, that's what that their helps. Is. They whack off into that little cap. Ah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you talking about the yamaka, like the little small one or yeah. the big one? The little one, oh. the small one. Holy shit! They come inside the. No that's why you never find DNA on those motherfuckers. They come inside the yamaka. Oh, and then they put it on their bald head? Yeah, no, they put it on, they start with putting it on hair, but the acid from the sperm burns through the, you know, with all that pickle juice, they ate a lot of pickle <laughs> seeds, so. <laughs> <laughs> I did show fucking Rogan the, uh, the fucking crackhead toss. Oh, yeah, what did he think? We put it on during the fucking fight oh, companion. How was your time down there? Honestly, yeah, really good. Nice, dude. Really good. Except for the no fucking sleep at night. 
without the fan. I forgot to bring my little fucking Boy Scout fan with me. And I, I can't shit. sleep without that noise. And I was up both nights for like four or five in the fucking morning spinning around. But how was Austin? It was an experience. It was great to see those guys. I hadn't seen them. I hadn't seen Brendan and Eddie since the pandemic. Wow, it's been that long? Yeah, since we all left. Uh, you know, they are what they are. They were the little family we had in L.A., you know, and it was great to see them. Uh, the, the fucking fight companion was awesome, you know. My podcast with Joe, again, it's Friday. It's 4 in the afternoon. We're both tired, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I I didn't get to watch the fight companion because, but I I saw the clip of you guys dancing with the smelling salts. Oh my god! So you you had some moves, dude. I, I like were those your old moves? What do you think you're dealing with old moves? They're new moves. I got a bunch of new moves. I get dance. I don't think this is a new people. move. No, nah, that's John Travolta. I had to throw it in there out of respect. You know what I'm saying? It's it's <laughs> fucking it's molest your masseuse month. So oh. I, I wanted to do a little I shout. Out. Dry January. Yeah, it's dry January and uh, fucking molest your masseuse month. Molest, molest your masseuse month. So I know Travolta's on there on a tear right now. Hey, rub this little thing under my nut. You know what I'm saying? Him and just <laughs> Holy shit! But that's it's uh, that's fun that you got to like. Do you think any of the of the reason you couldn't sleep is like you were just kind of like pumped up from like your two days? Like, no, there was something going on. Because I was sweating a lot at night, even though the air was on. There was something going on. Eh, I came, maybe I had COVID and didn't know it. Wow. Maybe it's another form of COVID. Because, dog, the sweatshirt that I wore on Saturday night to sleep, when I woke up, it was a light hooded sweatshirt. I had no T-shirt underneath. Okay. And I don't want to wake up to piss in the middle of the night and it's too cold to walk to the bathroom. Okay. When I woke up fucking Saturday morning, you thought like I had been running a marathon for four hours. I put the thing in a baggie and I got home. The bag was downstairs. And when I opened it up to put it in the laundry, my wife was walking by and I go, feel this. And she was like, Joey, what happened? I go, Dog, I don't know. The blanket, I mean, it was a great fucking hotel. I'm not going to name drop. You know, J Rogan takes care of you. Yeah. The blankets must have been those high-level thermal blankets. It was like being in a sauna. I would pee in the come back, and I couldn't lay in my spot. I thought I pissed the bed. I was drenched. I hate when that fucking happens. Well, you, you, you get back in the bed, and it's like you're laying on a funeral fucking, you know, <laughs> freezing to death. You're like, why the fuck am I freezing? Why not just take the sweatshirt off and leave it on the bed in case you got up? What? Because couldn't that be why you were sweating as you were wearing a sweatshirt to bed? No, because it was cold. So I didn't have, I knew if I got up in the middle of the night, the sweatshirt, I was cold with the fucking sweatshirt in that room. I had the fucking yeah. air down to 60 with the fan on high. That motherfucker dog, I was blowing smoke out of there. I thought I was in the exorcism so cold. There's a great hotel. So it went down at 60. I remember going to see the computer and I had to put a fucking jacket on to sit by the computer at night just to check something out to see what time the airline was leaving or, you know, when you get back to the hotel, the internet would go down. I'd have to reset it. Like I'd have to log in again. And, you know, I'd freeze to death. I go like, what the fuck is this? I'm sitting there with a hooded sweatshirt and a winter jacket on. But Austin was cold anyway, Lee. Really? Yeah, it was fucking freezing in Nashville. It was when I landed, it was humid and I had a heart attack at the airport. When I walked off on that ramp, it was so fucking humid. That humidity must have gone in my lungs. I started sweating profusely. It was the humidity problem. Oh, damn. Oh, yeah. It was still it, humid in January? Yeah. I, it was like I couldn't walk the baggage claim. It wow. was fucking a rough little walk. I had to stop and make believe I was talking on the phone. <laughs> People were walking around me. What's the matter with him? I'm like, uh, you know, so I got the lap bucket, back baggage claim, and then on the way back, I had no problems with nothing. I only slept two hours on Saturday night. I left for the airport at 6.15, got to the airport. The Salt Lake was open like a motherfucker. Oh, yeah? You got barbecue for breakfast? You, you bet you ask. I got a, I got a, two eggs with some brisket. Dude, that's I didn't all. even... 
You sent me a picture of some barbecue you got this weekend. Dog. Rogan took me to some place, and he ordered the ribs. I didn't order that. I couldn't eat that. Right. I I but the uh, I ordered the brisket with the smoked turkey and beans. It was fucking delicious. It's so weird. You move to, like, Boston, New York, and your friends tell you about this barbecue place, and you go okay. there, and you go there, and, and you eat it, and you go, yeah, it's good, you know? Or it's like being in L.A., and somebody goes, Joey, you got to try this pizza. It's just like New York. And you go over there, and you eat it, and you're like, yeah, it's okay. And then you come here for something, and you got a piece of pizza, and you go, oh, no. Whatever the fuck I was eating out there, I was wild. <laughs> It's the same thing. As soon as I've been to barbecue, there's a place here my wife gets brisket from. I really like the baked beans with the brisk, the, the burnt brisket in it. She yeah, the burnt ends, yeah. The burned ends. But, dog, once I went down there and tasted that brisket, it couldn't even, it wouldn't even hold on to the fork. It was crumbling. It was oh, fucking I love it was it. spectacular. Remember, bad barbecue in Austin is better than good barbecue in New York. And right. bad pizza in New York is better than good pizza in L.A. You can't fucking lose. I'm sure Rogan didn't take you to a bad place. Which place? Whatever place you got barbecue this time. Yeah, that's where he took me. But I'm saying it wasn't a bad place. It was a good place. No, no, it was a good place. We went to do stem cells. I shot oh, some shit. Stem cells in my knees. I did a stem cell IV. Did, did we you see down. a difference? Not yet. It's only been three days. I'm a little sore still. I hit the bag a little today, but I, I can't work out the whole week. Okay. I can't walk, so I could stand in front of the bag and just throw punches and sweat a little bit, put some fucking music on and get the party started. Or I get some more of those. I don't. I, I don't play around with smelling salts. I don't know what they're about. I only put them in my nose. And I'm about to faint, and I don't even have them at home. People put them in my nose when I pass out in the dentist office and shit like that. That's the first time I snorted out of a vitamin container. People in America are losing their fucking mind, but I guess bodybuilders use them. Uh, strength uh, power lifters use them. Apparently, get- comedian Josh Potter does it too. When I opened for Josh, he pulled him out. And I don't know how you were sniffing it. The clip I saw, I had you sniffing it for like 30 seconds. Who? Did you just not smell it? You, who, you. I- I was smelling it slowly. I could take it because when I wake, when I pass out, they just don't do this to me. They put them under my nose. They put one in each nose when I pass out. When I pass out, I go deep into the murky waters. That's why I don't like fucking going and giving blood sometimes. I got to go get blood this week. That sucks. And, the, and you pass out that they have to wake you up with smelling salts? I knew you would pass out, but I, I thought you would wake right back up. It hasn't been years since they had to do the smelling salt. But oh, thank it, God. When it was smelling salt, heavy duty. Because they gave me one one time, and I fainted when I smelled it. And they're like, this motherfucker's on a different level. <laughs> Wait, you have fainted? They woke you up with smelling salt, and then you smell the smelling salt and faint again? <laughs> again, then they put two of them in my nose. They were laughing when I woke up. And I remember yeah. talking to them with the smelling salts in my nose, and they were like, that is fucking crazy. I didn't know it was smelling salt. I didn't oh, do them together. Is this like, just because of like of the cocaine? Like, why do you think you, like, doesn't affect you? Because I fucking fainted so many times that, I, you know, I just got used to the smell of ammonia like that in my nose. Fuck. Those things, like, I, I would take, like, one little thing and it would, like, knock my head back. The first time I did it, knocked my head back, but then I got used to it. I saw that, yeah. First time I did it, it was powerful. It hit my lungs. I could feel it in my nutsack tingling like fucking somebody put acid in there. But you know what, man? We had a good time. I got to see my friends, and now I come back, and my mission is a little clearer. Okay. Whatever the fuck. On what you want to do this year? Yeah, yeah. Now, you, I know... I, like you did the podcast Friday, but did you think about doing stand up out there? Uh, I was considering it for Friday night, but I didn't hear from everybody. So I was very, uh, I don't know. Friday night, I was pretty fucking tired. Right. You know? Friday night, I was, I had just gotten up early. I didn't sleep the night before. 
So at six, Eddie wasn't coming in until like eight thirty. So at got six, it. I got some Cuban food. I took an Uber to get Cuban food, which is pretty good. A place called Habana. Okay. And then I went back to the hotel and I started watching fucking Rambo Eight. And I never heard from Eddie till about eleven. And Eddie had gone to the club, and he said nobody was down there. No, Tony Hinchcliffe got there late. So he came home. So I didn't feel that bad. And then Saturday, we were shooting. You know, we went to dinner at seven, and then we shot that at nine. <clears throat> and we were there till one. You know, there's no audience at one. Right. Oh yeah. It's so, right. And did you do stand up at all last week before you left? Yeah, yeah. I went down to Uncle Vinny's Wednesday night. Tomorrow night I was going to go to Sam's Club, but my daughter's got some. Oh, tonight. I was going to go to Sam's Club, but I had a, my daughter's got a recital at 630. She's playing the fucking drums. You know. Oh, shit. That's cool. Yeah, she's been playing them for years in the school band. Really? Since the third grade or something. Yeah, she joined in the third grade. Tomorrow she's doing the drums know. and the motherfucking triangle. So if you don't oh, know, you know, so yeah, I'm going to go with that 630. If I get out of there early and they don't want to do nothing afterward, then maybe I'll take a ride somewhere else around here. Because Sam's like an hour from here. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, the dojo. I'm excited. To, I'm going out there in a couple of weeks. That'd yeah. be really cool if you, I mean. It, it's just it, an open mic. It's just an open mic, guys. That's fine. Are you, but are you enjoying it still? Oh, yeah. It's it's great to do. Uh, listen, what I'm doing, it's a plan. And if it doesn't work, then you move on to the next chapter of your life. But this is how I need to do it for right now. I'm not rushing. I'm not booking dates. None of that shit. No, I'm just, I wanted to see how it was going. No, just keep getting on stage, having a good time, laughing, giggling, coming up with material. You know, like I said, the thing I missed the most wasn't the, Stand up. It was the creating. My mind needed to create again. You know, I got no more stories to tell. You know, I have to do something different. So this is the right. avenue. That's that's awesome, dude. I'm just happy that like you're you're enjoying it. It seems I didn't hear from any of those auditions last week. Uh, Three auditions. Is- I knew I went to the producers on one row. But I never heard from them. And again, I was sitting there today and I go, wow, that's weird. And I go, you know what? They got a better plan for me. Everything happens for a reason. I'm not going to get upset. I worked hard on those auditions. So I had to, you know, because it was for the same people. So I had to wear three costumes and hide myself a little more. I, did, You know, but what are you going to do? It just gets you better for the next time. This is, I wouldn't have had this attitude when I first got down there. I used to take a personal, go to the store and snort an ounce of coke. Now it's like you didn't get it. No big deal. You watch the show, the episode sucks. You're like, thank God. <laughs> you a fucking favor. And like, it, has it ever happened like that you waited, you know, a couple weeks, a month or two to get to hear back about auditions, or are they usually well, pretty quick? This is like a law and order type show. They shoot okay. these on a schedule. If you don't hear from them in four days, they went to somebody else because they start shooting, you know, 10 days. Then they take 10 days off. Those one hour dramas, they shoot 10 days. So, but maybe they won't call me till day eight. Who knows? You know, hey, right. listen, you wake up every morning and you try your best for that day. That's the, that's, if that's all you could do, that's all you could fucking do. Yeah. I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad you're enjoying it and not really getting crazy. too caught up in things. It's really crazy that there's a stand up page here and one of the guys on there asked, you know, he goes, it's Monday. You probably got on stage this weekend. What did you learn? And I go, I used to ask Lee that all the time, no matter how high we were. When we did the Ice House, any gig together on the way home, I'd ask you and Eric, what'd you learn tonight? <clears throat> you know, I want you to think about what you learned. So that stays in your mind. Then when you go home, you write something different. And I was sitting there today and I'm like, wow. Where did I learn that from? And I had to think for a minute, and I thought of you, because you once told me you had a couple different podcasts going, 
And you're like, these guys can't get it together. And they're professionals and they have degrees and fucking all this money. But the only guy that's consistent is a felon, you know? And I remember when I, I was doing comedy about three years. I met this comic named Rick Kearns. The reason why we attracted to each other is because he was crazy like me. Gambled, drugs, you know, and just loved getting on planes and doing comedy anyway. He would do any fucking gig. He was very funny. He was one of those guys that was funny 100% of the time because he was just naturally funny, you know. And when I moved back to Boulder in 94, you know, I was very fortunate. I got to work with him a lot. And I got to work with another master of writing, Todd Jordan. Todd Jordan was very professional. He was the HBO comic of the year. Oh, shit. I, I remember the name, but I didn't know he won that. Yeah, he was he was a special writer that I do. Uh, on the other hand, Rick had came in fourth in San Francisco comedy competition that year. He was very hot. But at the same time, he was very crazy. Rick is fucking 100% crazy and 100% hard. I haven't spoken to him since the pandemic started because he called me up when I moved here and he wanted a loan. And I'm like, I'm not working. He just didn't want a small loan. He wanted a big fucking loan. And I'm like, I don't have that number. I just bought a house. All my fucking, we didn't have it, Lee, you know? Right. And he got mad at me and I've been thinking about him ever since that, you know I mean? We all go through different things. He ended up getting the money, and it worked out for him and stuff, and he's doing well now. God bless him. But Rick was fucking crazy. So let's say we had a gig at 8 o'clock in Wyoming. Right. Right. He would fucking, like, either take a bus to me, and I would meet him, like, in Boulder at 5, and the first stop was at a liquor store. Oh, okay. He'd get a Gatorade. He'd get a big Gatorade and a bottle of vodka. Right there on the road, he'd throw the fucking Gatorade out. He'd leave like two ounces of Gatorade and he'd pour the whole bottle of fucking vodka in there and we'd drink it on the way up and then we'd stop and get another one and somebody always brought powder to the show and it was just, but on the way home, no matter how fucking high we were, he'd always go, what did you learn tonight? And I'd sit there like in awe because I didn't think I learned anything. But at the end of the day, you did learn. And you learned a ton of things. Not to talk to the manager. not You know, you just learn little things. But what did you learn on stage? And even though, listen, when you kill, you learn. And when you bomb, you learn. That's what's great about fucking comedy. That you learn both ways. You're going to learn something by yourself. You know, you're going to learn something by yourself. You know, I felt really bad for Joe Coy a couple of weeks ago. Because, again, it was people criticizing him that didn't know the art of comedy. And then somebody made a joke about that he flipped on the writers. He said, hey, I didn't write these jokes, you know. If that was any other situation, that's a very funny line. Right. You know? it's, as a stand-up, it's very funny. It's very funny. But on TV and in front of those muckety mucks, it's not a funny line. And then the press ran with it and whatever. But it's really funny. He didn't write that. Like, he wrote that on the spot because he wasn't doing well. And he was trying to get out of it? And he was trying to get out of it, you know. Any comic could see that. He did great, considering the fact of where he was. He had just forgotten where he was. We perform, you know, we work for years and you build an audience. And every time you do a show, it's your fucking audience. When you step great. out of yeah, it's 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 very weird. So when you step out, that's why I fucked up, but I wanted to feel that. That before I shot the Netflix special, I was going to the fourth wall and I was going to flappers. I should have been at the store in hindsight, but I wanted to work differently. It was a different, I didn't want people to see me. I had a bunch of reasons why. I forgot why I brought this up for the story, but it was just, uh, I don't know. You you were talking about like what you learned. Okay. And the recurrence type. 
I learned that I, I should have done it at the store. I, I should have worked on my special at the store, sharpening it, even though they were an audience that was familiar with me. The reason why I was going to flappers in the fourth wall was to go in front of an audience that wasn't familiar to me. I would do the fourth wall first to get the wording down, and then I would go to flappers in front of a show that had nothing to do with me. It could be a Polish show, and I'd go there. <laughs> right. And I'd go up, and out of the 30 people in the audience, one guy would go Uncle Joey. The rest didn't know me from fucking Adam, and that's enjoyable because you could really test your material. Right. I can see that. And that's, and that's, you were talking about Joe Coy and his experience. You felt bad for him because of what happened to him at the Golden Globes. And guess what? Even though he's a 10 time millionaire, even though he sold out the garden, he learned something that night. He learned yeah. himself that night. So whether it's good or whether it's bad, you're going to learn something. And Joe Coy has been doing comedy, what, 25 years? He's a fucking veteran. Have you ever had it? Because that happened to me a little bit this weekend. I did. I had a better show. And we talked about what days they were. But my better show was in front of people who didn't know me. Yeah. It's kind of strange. Lee, because you sold it. When I would go up in front of an audience that knew me, I could use both podcasts I go on, the podcast with the church and Rogan. I had so far to, to, to my realm. It's like mm -hmm. living in Seattle. And then moving to California, you are, you lose 10 minutes of material because you're talking about Seattle. A right. geological site, a fucking, you know, a geological, a fucking street corner, a certain restaurant. You went in front of a mall. What goes on up at that fucking airport, SeaTac, whatever. So you lose material. It's the same with that. It's the same kind of concept. That's why I said to, you know, keep writing. It's so important to after your show to keep writing and before your show to tune up your set. I don't really think you should start, you know, it's exercise it. Always do some writing exercises. Write about a situation in your first clip, first grade. I don't give a fuck. You know, I, I don't give a fuck. I used to write the weirdest stuff just to warm up. So I wouldn't sit there with a pen in my mouth. Fuck, that's an interesting way to start. Okay, so I, you said that before to just start writing. Why am I gonna sit there with a pen in my mouth for 45 fucking minutes doodling? Athena calls, my wife calls, mom calls, and you're sitting there the whole time with a fucking 45 minutes. Right. By the time you get to the hour, your hour 15 deadline, you started getting hot the last hour. But for right, that, the last few minutes. Yeah. But if you got there right off the bat, opened it up and just went into a story, any story, I don't give a fuck. You know, you don't. How long do you want to sit there with it? And maybe that story. Now, let's let's turn that funny. And you start scratching words out and putting words in and blah, 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 blah. Lee, it's fucking amazing. It's really and, fucking amazing. And it's I, I listened to what you taught. We talked about it a week or two ago about watching yourself and I really don't like doing it, but I've been it's, trying to do it. I, I have a phone that I record on now and I noticed for some reason, the Friday show, I just had my hand on the stool for like a good portion. Like, and it looked like, not like, like I was scared, but it didn't look as confident as like, if I don't know why I was touching it. It was just like, and I, it was just something I don't really, I know that's where I noticed my energy was down when I was watching it. Cause listening to it, it wasn't as noticeable. You learn a lot from tape. It's tough to watch, but you'll improve a lot faster. I really yeah. believe that. if you look at, I mean, listen, I don't want you to go to Mike's fucking snack shack and tape your open mics at and get upset with yeah. yourself. You're opening for Josh. You did what you did on Friday and Saturday. You know, that's when it's worth it for you. So you get an honest, an honest reaction from the audience. And it's you working under pressure. Yeah. When I go to an open I, mic, do you think I, I, I sit here and write before the open mic? <laughs> I go there to actually put a gun to my head to right. make me say shit, to make my mind work instead of. 
why sit there with the pen in your mouth? It's also like the how long did it take you to get comfortable to do 45 to an hour? To go from 25 to an hour? What do you mean? I noticed that I was focusing a lot on my set list and the order of things. Similar to when I started doing 20 instead of 10. All right. Let's now when fo- I do 20, 20. Let's focus your set down to a 30-minute set. Before we okay. could do 45, you're going to do 30 minutes. The education you got from that was actually doing the 45, and it's not easy. Nothing no. bothers me more than when somebody goes, I did 45 last week. Yeah, at a fucking bar. And you're not a headliner. No. You could call these club owners and tell you're a headliner, and somewhere along the line you're going to crash because you don't have your feet under you. Trust me what I'm telling you. I've seen it a thousand times. And it might, it might be so devastating at the third year that you don't recover from it. Those are the guys that quit right there. Yeah, after they bomb for 45? Yeah. No, they, they go up and think they're going to do 45, and they go into the wrong room, and they eat a bag of dicks, and they don't know how to get themselves out of it. And that's 45 minutes to get yourself out of If I am C and I bomb, I only got 10 minutes to learn my lesson. If right. I feature and I bomb, I got 25 minutes to learn my lesson. If I headline and I bomb, you might as well fucking trade places with Jesus. It's the same amount of time. They're going to kill you in a fucking hour. So this is why I don't like that. I want people to understand. And guess what? This is one of the things I never did because I knew headlining, like being a feature, like being a host, is an art. All three of them are distinctive fucking arts. And yeah, you're young now. You're a, a, a new comic. They're going to tell you how to read these ads. And they actually fuck with you when you, it, it messes with your material. But there's one day you're going to figure out how to read the ads in your jokes. Oh, as a host. As a host. Right. You know, and, yeah, it's, they're not going to sound like ads. Mm hmm. You know, coming next month, Cheech and Chong. The month after that, Tony Tanuja. The month after that, Joey did. Nobody cares. They're drinking. They're right. drinking. Why are you hitting them with three dates? Let's focus on Cheech and Chong. <laughs> and we'll come back next week and fucking vote on Jimmy Tooch. But for right now, let's focus on fucking Cheech and Chong, all right? You just learn shit. You just learn shit from being there. These little things that you just pick up. You know, so when you attack a MC spot, the owners of the clubs are going to be there. You usually feature Lee. But right. tonight, there's no feature spot. But the guy that runs the club, he's got 18 clubs. He's going to be there tonight. This is like stealing for you. You don't go, well, I'm going to feature. I'm usually an MC. Shut your mouth and make the best of what you got. You're an MC tonight? You got 10 minutes to rock. Right. So I suggest you, you write that fucking set out. You got a minute to greet him and welcome him. Maybe go into some crowd work. Maybe. Maybe. Are you pregnant? Thank him. Happy birthday. And then from there, bam, at the seven minute mark, stop and do do a fucking whatever ads he wants you to quickly. Like it's part of your material. <clears throat> and then you attack the, the last part of your set like a fucking manic. Like they just gave you fucking smelling salts up your asshole. And then you wrap up the mic. You got that last minute now. And now is when you go. I'm going to bring up the next guy. But don't forget, next week is Cheech and Chong. Two weeks from now is Lee Syatt, blah, 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 blah. Coming to the stage, the very funny Lee Syatt. Now, the I guy mean, that's... The, fe- the features also have to look at his style. What is my style? Is my style high energy? Is it low-paced? If it's low-paced, if I'm high energy and you're slow-paced, you're actually going to do... I don't know, 30 minutes of material in 30 minutes. I'm going to do 45 minutes of material in 30 minutes. Just joke, joke, joke. Just breathe. Watch your next, watch your next target. Unleash. Watch your next target. Unleash. Talk to them. Let them catch their breath. Bam. End it one last time. 
So it's all a strategy, Lee. Yeah, I know that's what I'm hoping, what I'm looking forward to improving because I don't have, like I, I do try to, like I have a set list and I think it flows okay, but it's just, I thought about you, you because you, I would ask you sometimes, like the, there was a difference between you doing 20 minutes at the store and doing a headlining, like you would slow them down a little bit and that's what you told me. Like you'd be like, you, yeah. they can't, I couldn't do that for an hour straight. It's an hour, so you have to slow it down. I only got 45 minutes of material. So I know I could rock them 45 heavy. What I'm praying for is for something to happen. Because I'm praying for some chick to say I love licking ass or, you know, some crazy chick in the audience, and then you run with it. Yeah, you know, yeah. that's what you're praying for, and you will get it. Because your material... Do you ever struggle running with it? You what? Do you, like... Because I'm just thinking, when you're saying run with it, like crowd work or reacting to something, like I can react to something and go into material. Reacting, completely improvised, it's not that I don't do it, but it's not very long. It's like two minutes. Okay. The, well, the, 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 like, did you did you ever die doing that? Like, with it, Or were you always good at that? That seems like something you probably no. were pretty good at. No, the problem, I started improvising by mistake. I was a house MC at a fucking restaurant. And I had right. to be there every Tuesday, and the first two rows were the same fucking people every week. They came in to get the prime rib for fifteen ninety nine. Right. So after about two months, I was in the, my beginning stages. I said, I can't keep doing this with the same material. So I would write the whole week. I would come up with five new minutes every week, then seven new minutes. And I remember there was a time I was doing ten, and it was because I was doing crowd work. And. I got into a bad habit with crowd work, and then I got into the worst habit. I moved to New York, and this and is the, like and this is the town of hey, where you from? Oh, you a truck driver from the Bronx? What do you sell? Ovens? <laughs> you know, fucking. It just went on and on and on. And then I went somewhere, and a club corrected me, and they said you can't do that here. And he goes, I know you can do it. But I don't want you to do it because I want you to work on your material for the next time you come here. Wow. And then you get really good. You know how to improvise and take it back to your material. Then improvise and take it back to your material and improvise. So I always like when people learn how to improvise. Like once you get stand up down for two years and you're comfortable, go off the limb a little bit and learn that realm. And then you, after a while, you'll find your whatever. For years, I thought I was funny if I didn't write one up there. Guess what? I, I had 40% good sets. Well, and when you, at that point, were you taking like an improvised something and turning it into a joke? Or you were just. No, I was up? just trying to improvise. Go up there and talk to the audience. Wow. That's crazy. It, it, even to me, having 40% good sets doing that is pretty fucking high. No, you want to be at 80. 90 percent you want one bomb out of 10 oh well you yeah but with material yeah but if yeah. you're going up there with no plan and just being funny off the cuff and in front of an audience well i was doing a lot of that shit at the at the seattle underground on mondays and tuesdays Jeez. but then when i wanted to work harvey's and all those other clubs they were like you gotta do material man and there's some people who are really 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 good at it but you'll see after a while that, I don't know. I mean, Jeff Ross is good at it, so I could be really wrong. You know, Hollywood just doesn't react to it after a while. You know, not Hollywood, but just there's too many people doing it. I don't want you to ever get in the habit of it, but I want you to know what you're doing. Real quick, let me talk to these people about better help. I'll be right back, Lee. Hey, Uncle Joey here. Listen. The check-in is brought to you by BetterHelp. You're saying, Joey, what's BetterHelp? BetterHelp is an online therapy that's very helpful for celebrating your strengths, working through your weaknesses, and learning to set boundaries and taking action in your life. I don't know what that means. All I know is I was fucked up, and I contacted Blue, uh, BetterHelp, and they put me with some woman, and she taught me coping skills. I don't know nothing about weaknesses. I don't know nothing about learning to set boundaries. All I know is that, you know, I was fucking out there where the buses don't run. And they brought me back in. Listen, BetterHelp is tremendous. Why? Because it's completely online. So you could talk 
to your therapist through video chat over the phone or by message, whatever works for you. For me, I spoke what I want to see who I'm talking to. What is this? Some bar and some, I don't even know. Just fill out a brief questionnaire. You get matched with a licensed therapist and you could switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. They don't, you know, listen, better help is here to help you. They're a great service. I believe in them 150%. Why? Because, you know, when I got here, I was getting flashbacks from Vietnam. I was, you know, people would chat. I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, don't worry about me right now. I'm back because of better help. So celebrate the progress you've already made. Again, I don't know what they're talking about. Visit betterhelp.com slash Diaz today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash Diaz. Trust me, BetterHelp is going to help you get there. You know how I know? Because they took care of Uncle Joey. And now without further ado, back to Lisa yet. All right. See, I don't even know what we're talking about, Lee. Sorry to interrupt you, but I had to tell these beautiful people about better help and how they get a little help every once in a while. Uh, you know, shit happens we, we, to talk to people. Absolutely. Um, you were talking about improvising, but like I was, I was also I wanted to ask you. I don't know if if, if you've ever dealt with this, like uh, uh, the wrong reaction to your jokes. Like some guy was very nice. He came both nights. But I'm I'm kind of self-deprecating is my style, and like he was, like he like he would laugh, but he would also go ah oh, a lot, and it was like a it's not something I was, I knew how to deal with. Like, I don't know if anyone's ever like had a, a weird reaction, like a little wrong, uh, not the reaction you were looking for to your joke. Was it his face or was he talking? He he said it a couple times. He wasn't rude, but he was just like he. That was his reaction. I think he just like liked me. No, he was fucking rude. He was rude. I'm not gonna sit there and analyze each of your fucking jokes. He was rude. And next time, don't pay him no fucking mind. Don't even look at okay. the motherfucker. Look at him one time and then look the fuck away from, because those people go out to ruin your night. That's some I fucking snobby like dude. That's some snobby dude that nobody invited him to dick. Not even his mother invited him over for dinner because he's so fucking annoying. So now he's going out of his way to break somebody's balls who's trying to do something with their life. You know, it's it's like when I shot the the thing in Chicago. Oh, that yeah. fucking kid you kick him in the fucking face. I mean, it was it was horrible. He was hammered. He did not want to be there. And he was jealous that his girlfriend wanted to be there. Dog, she was 30 years younger than me. I'm not going to hit on her. And she didn't want to. She just liked that whole group. There was a ton of girls I spoke to on the road that came with their boyfriends, and they were the primary fan. It wasn't a lot. It was a lot of, that's why I always brought a woman to open for me. Because I had a lot of pe guys that would come. A lot of women would buy tickets for their boyfriends. And I got three three guys going up. I got the whole room filled with women. So I would have a woman go up before me so they could get something too. Right. But every once in a while, it's a woman who wants to come. She watches Rogan. She watches whatever. She knows what's going on and she wants to hang out, you know? And yeah, but I remember that couple fighting in your special. That was, that's, I can't believe that happened. It was horrible. It was fucking horrible. And there was a point where I was ready to fucking kick him. I could not believe that you work so hard all your life to get a special for somebody to pay attention. And tonight is the night. Some fucking drunk shithead wants to come and ruin your night because she bought tickets for herself. But he didn't trust her. So he said, I want to come. Why would you want to come if you don't like him? Well, because, uh, and they come. I learned that when Rogan was on Fear Factor. That was one of the openers. I saw that a lot. It was a table of girls, and there'd be one husband. That fucking uh -huh. loser. And he'd be sitting there glaring at you, glaring at you, hating on you, hating on you. Well, what'd you do? Instead of fucking getting caught up, you just looked into the audience and made them laugh their ass off. So he hated you even more. You want his wife to go, 
isn't he funny? And for him to go, <laughs> go boom. So that's how you work those dudes. Don't even look at them. Do your show. Be as funny as can be. And after a while, if you pay them attention, they're going to keep doing that. Right. Somebody's talking to you. You don't talk back to them. They're going to eventually stop. You, there was one time that I like I saw you deal with like like it was it's probably like the best dealing with a heckler I've ever seen. And it wasn't, and it was similar. Like I, we were in Denver, and after every joke you did, this woman went, "Yeah," and you just didn't react to it. <laughs> like, and I, like she she was not hiding it. She would laugh, but then she would like just do yeah. Like after every joke. <laughs> and I don't think you said anything. I don't think you said one, <laughs> one word to her. I was like, Jesus Christ, how does he handle that? Let them let listen. First off, when you're young, you want to battle the audience member. Right. A bad habit to get into. Unless the guy throws something at you, a knife, a bottle. Uh, listen, they go, oh, I like the shoes. Oh, you know, whatever. If you get into it with them, you're going to get hot. And the audience didn't pay there to see you get mad or to see yeah. you shut down. I shut down a heckler for 20 minutes and say everything. You know, I don't go to your job and knock the dick out of you. You know, it's the same shit. So I decided right. one day, don't say nothing to them. They go away on their own. And after a while, the laughter dulls or something. And after a while, security just throws them out. They're either drunk. I saw one time when Joe was on Fear Factor, we did Brea. And do you remember the doorman at Brea was a real muscular guy? I think there so. Was a headed guy that had, was bald and he looked like a fucking door. I don't know if it was Brea or Irvine. Was it, we was it La Jolla? No, no, no. It was an improv. It was it La Jolla? Okay. No, it was an improv. He was a big guy. You could tell. I mean, this guy probably... Ate a box of steroids a day, you know. He, he even had a heart attack years later. He lived, but he lost all the weight. He came to an improv, and he was walking with a cane. I mean, it was bad. Oh, shit. Yeah, he was fucking big at one time. A little too big. And he was tough. And I opened up. It's probably online. God damn it. Even when I turn the phone off, I get these fucking things. I don't understand. I'll figure it out for you. Yeah, I got to turn it off on the computer. And now, all day, I don't hear from these fucking losers. And now, at 8 o'clock at night, they want to fucking be my friend. Get the fuck out of here, stupid motherfuckers. So when I got up there, this guy was already being a problem. He was being a problem when Ari was up there. Ari was opening, and I was the feature act. In fact, if you go online, you'll find the video. It's up. Some Somebody taped it. And they attacked me for going off on the guy. And it was probably that tape that made me go, I get it now. Instead of arguing with them. And then I would see other comics get into an argument with, and it just shuts the show down. Right. It does. It's awkward. It conflicts the show. Now you got to work from zero again. Now I'm in the bottom of the grave and I got to dig myself up to the top. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's whatever the expression you use, but. I remember I went off on the fucking guy. And finally, Joe went up, and he went after Joe, and that's when it got ugly. I mean, the security guard came and choked him, and he was yelling police brutality, and they beat him up outside. And as I walked outside, the wife looked at me, and she goes, this happened like six weeks ago at a different comedy show. Then why would you bring it to another fucking comedy show? Jesus Christ, he goes to different... That's one thing I I normally don't get like heckle heckled, but I don't like that. It's just a crazy thing. Some comics invite it and I don't get it. Like that's like my my worst nightmare. I don't want to get heckled. Look, everybody's different. Everybody's looking for a different every like I said, what did you learn tonight? What did you learn tonight? I learned that I went after a heckler and he left. And I'm better than you know. Think about, was this business or is this a fucking rap? There's a thing called whatever, that challenge, what's it called? They used to do it at the store where you tear each other up upstairs on Tuesday night. Oh, roast battle. Roast battle. Go to a roast battle. I I actually had that written down. Have you ever done, like, roasting jokes? 
No. No? Okay. No. I think it's always been fucking stupid. I don't want to get into a fucking <laughs> argument with nobody because they're going to take it somewhere and then I'm going to take it somewhere and it's not going to be fun for either for him or for me. Maybe I'll say something to get under his skin or he'll say something to get under my skin because there's a thin line. You know what I'm saying? There's like right. a thin line. And then somewhere along the road, I remember years ago, they were doing a series about that. Mm-hmm. It was, it was, I was fucking Ralph. Ralph. If you look at early Ralphie, he did a series. Oh, okay. Remember where I think one of the girls, Jody, went off on Ari because of his nose and shit. I didn't want to do it. I didn't get it. I don't like roasting celebrities. Not that Comedy Central always asked me, but I don't. I didn't like doing that shit. No roast. I like stand up. I'm a stand up fucking comic. You know. That's it. It's that fucking simple. And that's what you define as your as you're getting into the business. You know, I was when I did the podcast with Joe, I told him, I said, there's gonna be a time when I just want to do stand up again. There's not gonna be any podcast, there's not gonna be any acting. For like a year or two, I just want to write and perform 10 minutes a week, 20 minutes a week, just to see what it was like to put all your attention into stand up, you know, with the social media and the videos and everything somewhere along. And I told Joe, even with the sponsors, somewhere along the line, you forget what you got into this for. This is the reason why years ago, 30 years ago, Bill Hicks went after fucking uh, Jay Leno. And he said that Jay Leno should get a gun and shoot him, stick it in his mouth and shoot himself and blow the back of his brains on the NBC Peacock. You know, and you think about that. I remember going to Houston one time and a young bunch of young comics were like, oh, fuck that, man. You do commercials. Like, I, I got an addiction. I got to <laughs> feed this addiction. Money at 100 dollar a set you know i don't have a rich mommy and daddy like you motherfucker driving up here with new jeeps and shit you know it, it's it, it's different for everybody i didn't do commercials because i wanted to i did commercials because they fucking paid and i got insurance out of it you know i i really enjoyed doing movies and tv certain projects i really when enjoyed was the last doing- time you when was the last time you did only stand up Nineteen ninety seven. So from ninety one to ninety seven, I didn't get headshots till ninety five. Never. Just focused. Just focused on stand up, writing, stage, writing, stage, writing, stage. There was no nothing else. There was no distractions. And that's why when I'm writing this book about stand up, I have to make it clear that you could take all the pictures with funny comics that you want. You go to all the award shows. You could, you know, you could do all the shortcuts you want. But at the end of the day, all they're going to give a fuck about is the one thing. Because once that gets up, then everything else gets noticed. You know, and some people have a lot of success with videos and stand up. You know, Eric Alessandro is great with that stuff. I love Eric's videos. Have you ever watched Eric Alessandro's videos? I don't, I don't know if I have. He makes the best videos any comedian can fucking make. Really? That kid can end up a big time director someday. Comedy is just a stepping stone for him. If he doesn't direct, in 10 years, he's going to be in 15 years, I call, he directs a big movie. That's going to be his path. He makes these little videos that are tremendous. And he's getting popularity from him, and he writes, and he performs, and he goes on tour, you know, but it's some people I don't want them to get. I see a bunch of comedians at my level, a little that came like five or six years after me, they're trying to go to award shows. They hire a publicist and they go to all these uh, Latino women and this and that. <laughs> look, that gets you nothing because the people that go to those things are all looking for the same thing, a fucking handout. 
So that, but if that's what you think your career should be doing, what would you rather do? Go do three sets in LA or go to an award show and sit there and dream of being next to Brad Pitt, you know, and hopefully get into the back or go to a party. Yeah. You could pay your publicist 3000 a month and she'd get you those. She, you're not going to get into Elton John's party. Right. But you get into this, some kid that plays, you know, I don't know, one of these fucking terrible shows and he's like the eighth lead. He'll have a party and they'll let you in there. You know, it's just so weird what it became, what I saw, the waste. You know, I enjoyed just doing stand up, but I enjoyed podcasting. I really fucking did. You know, now it's going somewhere different all of a sudden. You know, it's, it's changing. It's going to shorter podcast. It's, you know, so it's very interesting. Even for you and me, sometimes I sit there and I go, it was completely different when we started. It was oh, so yeah. different, you know. And now it, the, the, the people got in it and they just, I don't know. It's weird now. Everybody's got a podcast. And I ain't mad at nobody. It's the way it is. But it was a different market when we got in. There was only 10 drug dealers on the block. Now right. there's and dealers everywhere. There was only eight. not all of them. Huh? I was going to say not all of them, but like some of the biggest podcasts are by famous. Like there were no, like the most famous person who had a podcast was Kevin Smith when we started. Yeah. Like that. And, and now fucking Bateman, like, like there's so many podcasts like hosted by movie stars. And well, it's, yeah. it's just this week I'm in Vancouver at the house of comedy with Josh. He's filming a special. Oh shit. Yeah, I'm going up. I'm doing shows on Friday. He he's filming on Saturday, but I'm going up on Friday and Saturday at the House of Comedy. In you have shows on Friday. Yeah, and Josh is filming a special on Saturday, so make sure you go to that one. Two shows. I think so. Yeah. Good. Good. See, that's the other thing now. Comics have freedom again with specials. Everybody wanted a Netflix special. Everybody wasn't going to get a Netflix special. You know, a lot of people didn't. And it stopped people from growing. They're like, I got to shoot a special. I'm waiting for Netflix. Shoot your own shit. Break it down to seven-minute routines. You know, it doesn't have to be fucked. That's what's great now. You could shoot one of these with a fucking iPhone. Straight on you. Connect yourself to a mic. Get your buddy to come down with the soundboard. You want it to sound. I want it to sound like Richard Pryor. One of his albums or fucking, you know. Something by Paul Mooney early. You know, I want it to sound like a red fox. I don't want it to sound like everybody makes this shit sound today. Because then you're not different. You're the same fucking, you know. It's a different world, my friends. It is. And, and you're going up on Wednesday, you think? If if her uh, recital gets over? Well, Tuesday is the recital. Tonight. Got it. Okay. So tonight it's 630. I think it starts at 7. You know, we're not going to get out until 8.30. And then 8.30, if I drive an hour, it's I'm walking up to go do a set at an open mic and bump people or whatever. I don't want to do that. I want to get there early, talk to some of the comics, you know. I don't want to get there in a rush like I'm Johnny Goomba and just, you know, uh, would you like to go on stage? No, I came here to fucking call my... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, I love it, buddy. It was good to talk to you. It was good to talk to you, man. And we'll uh, we'll talk tonight or tomorrow. Absolutely. Talk later. All right. Have a good night. Thank you, brother. Thank you for watching the show tonight. The check-in with Uncle fucking Joey and Lisa Ayat. See you as cocksuckers next week. And now for the ad of the week. <laughs> <laughs> What's happening, you savages? Uncle Joey here. Welcome to the check-in. It's Tuesday, the 23rd of January. I got to talk to you for a minute. Guys, remember the days when you could have sex in the morning, afternoon, late at night, and four times here? You were a savage. Remember those days? You didn't give a fuck. Things may have slowed down with age, but thank God for Blue Chew. You're saying, Joey, what are you torturing me for? Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra. I thought Levitra was a heart medicine, but who gives a fuck? 
all these ingredients, but it's a chewable tablet at a fraction of the cost. You can take the tablets any time of the day so you can plan ahead or pop one whenever you bump into a victim by mistake. You know what I'm saying? Listen, these things are great. They come in individual pouches. You can put them in your wallet. Just don't sit on it. And, uh, you know, you meet somebody, you bump into your wife, your girlfriend, you're at a bar, you want to get the party started, you want to give her a stab in the bathroom, you want to ask for some water, you pop a pill, and within 15 minutes, you know, you're doing your thing. The best part about Blue Chew is it's all done online. No talking to no fucking doctor. You don't got to wait online at some fucking bum pharmacy. Well, everything that you're going to need is right there at your doorstep in a discreet package. The mailman won't know what it is. Your mom won't know what it is. Grandma won't know what it is. Even the victim won't know what it is. Blue Chew wants you to have better sex. Discover your options at bluechew.com. Chew it and do it, Jack. And listen, it's Tuesday. We got a special deal for the check-in listeners. Try Blue Chew free. I'm promising you all these fucking things. You're like, Joey, how am I going to give mama a stabbing for free? Because this is Uncle Joey, baby. I'm giving you Blue Chew for free. All you got to do is pay $5 for shipping. That's it. That's BlueChew.com. Code Joey to receive your first month on the arm. Again, that's BlueChew.com. Promo code Joey. And get your party started. Get your freak on. You can bet. You can put on some eyebrows and a cape, whatever turns you on. And now, without further ado, let's see what the hell Lee's doing. 